So let's start. Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's October 19th, 2011. And um, somebody pointed out we have two Jose's here. So we're going to have them introduce themselves first. Um, but uh, I, I was trying to put this tagline at the beginning of the show. So let me try to do this. So we are Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, we are a weekly webcast on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. And tonight we're going to be talking about youth voices and we're going to be talking about occupying education. And um, it's great to have a couple of people who have never been on the show before. Um, Mary Beth, that's not you. You've been on one other time. Welcome. <laughs> Mary Beth, why don't you introduce you. yourself? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I guess, what do you want to know? <laughs> what? What do you do? What kind of teaching are you doing? You're an educational technologist in an elementary school? How's that work out? Okay. Um, <laughs> so yes, I, I am in Philadelphia. I teach in a computer lab. I teach kindergarten through seventh grade. I'm a certified instructional technology specialist, which is a big long title. Um, and uh, I do a lot of blogging, social media, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Um, I also am on the board of a food co-op that's trying to open in South Philly, so I'm into that kind of stuff too. Cool. And you took pictures at Occupy Philadelphia, is that true? And you're sharing them with your students? You can tell us about that. Um, a little bit. I actually have not had a chance to share them with my students. My room did not have a projector until about, I don't know, maybe three days ago. Um, and now it's a, on a chair on the wall. So um, I have not been able to share pictures with them. Um, I did share them with my, on my blog. Uh, I did go down there to kind of talk to people about Occupy Education and to pass out some flyers about it and just kind of see what was going on down at City Hall. So uh, I did get to actually visit the, um, the people down there. Let's get to the Jose's here, um, and you guys need to help us figure out how to address each of you. Um, Jose Rodriguez, why don't you start? <clears throat> Welcome. Hi, hi there. Uh, I was going to actually call myself Ho Jose B, <laughs> an old Mexican uh, farming joke there. But uh, uh, yeah, well, hi. I'm a fifth grade teacher out in uh, Los Angeles, California, and so been part of the Etic Talk kind of community for. I guess since the beginning of 2006, and so. Yep. It breaks into teacher teaching. Not 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 a lot in the actual um, the programs, but I, but I do listen to other podcasts. So uh, and 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 I saw on, on Google Plus this past week with Paul uh, presenting one of the one of the um, youth voices uh, 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 educators, uh, it's in elementary, so uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I thought I, I'd give it a try. So that's me. Cool. So we'll talk about that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how to, what I'd like to think of as an online, online one room schoolhouse where elementary school kids can talk and middle school kids can be there and high school kids can too. Um, and Jose, is it Vilson? Vilson. Vilson. <laughs> okay. And Jose, you're a neighbor. I live here in Washington Heights. And uh, so it's nice to have you on, um, fellow New York City teacher. Why don't you introduce yourself a bit, though? You're brand um, new to our show. I, I guess um, we'll, we'll call the other Jose uh, the Jose. So. I'll just be the JLV for now since that seems JLV. to be the modus operandi here. Um, you guys know my Twitter handle, the JLV, but in general, I'm a math coach, math teacher, um, writer of various posts in various places. Um, I've also been doing a little bit of work with, you know, activist situations here in New York City and also across the nation. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with people with uh, under the Occupy the Classroom uh, piece there. So it's been a lot of, I guess, being occupied with occupation, <laughs> shall we say. That verb has changed, hasn't it? <laughs> just, just a bit, just a bit. 
Uh, Chris Sloan, do you want to check in? <clears throat> I'm just going up my screen. Yes. Sorry about that. It's not so uh, bad. I have this. Uh, how's that sound? It's a little tick, but it's okay. You look good. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Paul. That's <laughs> That means a lot to me. Uh, so I'm Chris Sloan. I teach in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I my students compose in youth voices quite a bit. And so I'm interested to talk tonight because actually I haven't done explicit writing assignments around it, but a lot of my students have been uh, composing about that. You know, they're, they're pretty fired up about it without me um, doing any um, directed assignments about it. So that's been pretty cool. I'll just say this and your kids let me know what the news is. Uh, the, the wild animals in Ohio, I didn't know about until your <laughs> students uh, let me know about that. But, uh, yeah, so if I, you I lived in that town in Ohio, you would definitely know about the lions on the loose. This is true. <clears throat> right. Chad, welcome back. <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, I'm Chad Sansing, and I teach humanities at a, at a Virginia charter school. It's a, a middle school for non-traditional students uh, who, who struggle in a more traditional environment. Um, we, uh, some of our, some of us are, are more aware of the, the Occupy movements than others, both the, the one on Wall Street uh, and our, our own local flavors. And we've done a little bit of work in some classes talking about um, kind of how to affect change in, in our own classroom. Um, and, I, and I say we've only talked about it in some classes because some of our classes kind of have it figured out uh, and some of our classes are still um, trying to move away from a teacher-centric model. So we're, we're doing some of that work in the classroom to try to make it a more uh, student-led place. Uh, and I hope to write about that either at Classroom or at Co-op Catalyst pretty soon. Um, and uh, working with Mary Beth and some other people from the Co-op to kind of put together a companion site uh, to what educators are doing to kind of occupy the, 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 the occupation of teaching um, at occupyedu.tumblr.com. You know, let me jump in on that with a thought that one of the issues for me in encouraging students right at the beginning of the year, especially, to pursue their own questions, their own issues. Um, and you, know, you want to do that more than one time. You want to do that four or five times before they get the idea that, that, that we really want them to stay with the question that they right. care about and they're passionate about. And then, you know, Occupy Wall Street comes up, and I want to kind of say, wait, look over here. <laughs> There's this great thing happening, and how not to make that then teacher-centric is, is, I think, an interesting question. Um, for me, it is. Uh, yeah, well, it's a... Uh... Go ahead, Jim. <clears throat> I was just going to say that, that that's the real struggle, like for trying to figure out um, who to match up with what resource at any time. It is kind of the name of the game, and with Occupy Wall Street, there are some students who, like, can point them towards a towards a site like the the New York Times uh, Learning Network blog, collecting resources about the 99%. And they're off and running, and then there are some who feel like they have such they're kind of they don't know where to begin because they don't have background knowledge about it or background knowledge necessarily about um, asking questions themselves and, and and going for the answer. So. If anything, it provides the opportunity for a lot of that kind of struggle in the classroom, which is great, I think. That's interesting. And I, I think, Paul, what you were saying, I'm going to jump in here, it was kind of the idea of just because me, the teacher, is interested in it doesn't mean that it's what the kids are interested in. And that idea that Chad was talking about, that you know, if it's student-centered, then if the students bring it up, then it's something that we should discuss. But is it forcing them forcing my opinions on them if I say okay let's talk about this Occupy Wall Street stuff I mean I know my kids and it's surprising my kids have not brought it up once um, and my kids talk about all kinds of stuff and we have one in Philly that's pretty big and pretty much a big deal um, so I don't know I, I don't know if that's kind of what you were hinting at that idea of it being just because me a teacher that I'm interested in it that doesn't mean that I should be forcing my students to learn about it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the ways I think about it is, um, you know, 
I one of the things I want my students to do is to learn how to use Wikipedia well. Um, and often doing that as a whole group is a useful activity because they can see how each other you know respond to the same article before they go off and find their own. So I kind of think it's okay if I'm doing Occupy New York or <laughs> Occupy Wall Street um, and that that's the Wikipedia article that we analyze. So that's sort of how I rationalize it. There's a there's sort of a there's an example that I'm providing for them, but I'm always really cautious to to keep their their inquiry about whatever it is um, going to at the same time. Um, Sherry, I want to introduce you, and then um, David, you want to introduce yourself. Welcome. To you. Okay, this is Sherry Sorry. Edwards from. I teach in Nespelum, Washington on the Colville Indian Reservation and my students just plain struggle. Um, they probably don't know anything about Occupy <laughs> Wall Street, um, but I do think I have a responsibility to bring it up whether they pursue it or not. And I, and I have not done that. We are, we've had a difficult week with some difficult issues in the, in the school and we've been dealing with that. So. I teach reading and writing to 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And we do quad blogging with three other classes. And we'd like to start with uh, get into youth voices too. So that's where I'm from. Sounds good. Can you say more about the difficulty? Um, not to press you, but. More about what? The difficulties you've been facing or the struggles kids are having? Or... Um, oh, last year we had a, a new teacher and I asked her what she thought uh, were the issues at our school and she said, at any other school you would have more kids who wanted to learn and they would keep the other kids focused. But in our school, the kids come to socialize and they, they're not there to learn. So it's always a it's always an issue of moving them forward. And we are one of those schools where you have to post your objective every day and we have walkthroughs to walk in to make sure we're doing exactly what we say we're, that we're doing. So um, being student-centered is sometimes a little difficult, but that is where I, students, is not an easy, easy task. So. Well said. But, um, that doesn't mean they're not intelligent, and it doesn't mean they don't want to go forward in their lives. And so I just have to find that spark that helps them. Thank you so. for joining us. David, uh, sure. welcome. Introduce yourself, welcome. please. Yeah. Am I just introducing myself? Um, yes. My name is sure. David. Um, I'm a writer for uh, Cooperative Catalyst. Um, I'm a community organizer working with uh, the Institute of Democratic Education in America. Um, I've been working uh, to help moderate the uh, Occupy Education uh, blog that uh, Cooperative Catalyst started up, um, and I live in Oregon. In my head, I was trying to categorize us. Some of us are elementary school teachers, other of us are in middle schools. Um, would you say you're an adult educator? Or? Uh, I'm actually, I work with, uh, right now I've been working with uh, preschool ages. Uh, oh, really? Working with actually infants uh, in the last few months. So, but um, more in the child care arena. But I learn from my, all, all, all learners. Okay, so let me Hey, hey say, Paul, can I ask something real quick? Yeah, and I wanted to say, Please do that, and please, I want to move back now that we've all been introduced and, you know, have you all jump in and go ahead, Chris. Yeah, this is off topic, so to speak. Um, Cynthia from Alaska would like to join us, yep. but she can't find, can you send the link to this Hangout? And my other question off topic is, how do I find the link to this Hangout? <laughs> it's uh, at edtechtalk.com slash live and there's a link oh. right there that says join this hangout hello 
Okay, you. thanks. You got it? Can you send it to her? Thank you, Jose. Yeah, I will. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So I don't know where to start. Okay. Um, Jose, uh, J JLB, you look like you want to say something. Um, why don't you jump in? What, what, what would you like to talk about? What's up? What's on your mind? <laughs> Having introduced um, these folks to you. I, I guess my my primary thought is that um, education is a big monster, and um, I do mean monster in um, of various ways as well. Uh, one thing that I'm noticing is because educators, you know, have this venue now where we can kind of form multiple arms. I think it's important for us to, you know, I, I guess look at Occupy Wall Street. Like when I went down there, I found myself um, enthralled by all the you know, types of people that went down there and they kind of had a model where it was more about inclusion instead of exclusion um, in a sense that they had you know, maybe some founding principles, but at the end of the day, you could have been anybody walking down the street. And so long as you identified with whatever this 99% rule was, then it worked well. Um, and that, that kind of comes out of recent discussions I've had about um, education as a whole and how do we create solutions for what's happening now. Um, doesn't need to have this one singularity per se. Um, it's important for us to kind of attack it the way that we possibly can in whatever venues we have. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of that now. So I kind of just want to throw that out there. But I mean, I see a lot of powerful work happening. And I mean, anything that we contribute is, you know, going to make that movement even more powerful. Um, I could add something to that, Jose. Um, you know, I had one of the students who posted is a pretty liberal thinker, and yet uh, someone who chimed in on her post uh, was like ultra conservative. So, um, I, it seems like yeah, a lot of different types of people are even in my classroom have kind of identified with that movement. And I would jump in there as well. Um, I wrote a post about this, but I, everything I see, I always see through the eye or lens of education because I just, that's the disease that I have. But I noticed when I was down there, um, just the way that things were organized. I mean, there was a security tent that was not police. It was actually just protesters who decided to be security people. So when people are sleeping at night, they'd have shifts to walk around and make sure everybody's safe. They had a library. They had a a whole board of workshops that you could take and kind of like classes you could take. They had an information booth where people could drop off flyers and where they listed all the, the scheduled meetings for the day. I mean, it was crazy organized. And all I could think was about how as teachers, we have all these things happening to us, but that, and you know, we are a very diverse group, but why can't we do something similar where we self-organize and come together and you know we have a certain core thing that we all agree on you know the standardized testing the way that the education is going no matter what our beliefs are there's definitely something that we can all kind of rally around and organize around and it's just kind of amazing to see this little community this little microcosm of a, of a country almost <laughs> or a city kind of grow on the outside city hall yes David, were you going to say something or no? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, I, I've been kind of studying small communities and uh, just growing up with this kind of uh, kind of energy of people, and I just I find this pretty amazing to see this. Is, I think this is a shift in a, a shift in our society finally like taking what was good of um, open source kind of internet communities and actually trying to bring the kind of idea back into kind of face-to-face -face connection. The idea of like, here's, I have something to give. Who would like to, who else has something to give? Let's put them together and make something better. Um, I think it's actually a shift that we're having finally towards uh, a different way to be community. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, it, the, Go ahead, Chad. I, I was going to say it does. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, why, why and how um, 
the, the founders of the co-op started, how Occupy EDU is coming along. I'd love to hear more from the JLV about Occupy Your Classroom. Um, my my primary kind of like concern or the thing that I, I would like to help people accomplish is that kind of individual decision to change things. And for me, occupying education uh, at one level is a very personal decision to do things in your classroom that you know are right by your students and that are right by learning. And the community pieces around it and the importance of colleagues, parents, students, uh, other people, community members who have a vested interest in quality of life in the schools around them. To me, what that community does is kind of create a space of, of people and a space of permission for those individual choices to change something that you know needs to be changed or to ask a question you haven't asked yourself yet. And that's kind of what I appreciate most about this moment that um, a significant number of Americans are creating space for others to question and, and answer in new ways. Cynthia, could you introduce yourself? You have the best background, I gotta say, but welcome <laughs> from Alaska. Uh, thank you. It's a, a quilt that my mom made, and uh, sorry it's been so hard for me to um, participate in these chats recently, but um, I think Good I know time. how to get into them now. And uh, I teach here in Valdez, Alaska, and I'm banging my head against the wall still in terms of getting the site unblocked at my school, but um, I'm still working on it. Did I notice another teacher from Valdez also joined the site? In addition to you, I thought an English teacher from there did. Did you know that? <laughs> um, no, perhaps one of my students was able to make a profile. Um, oh. Was it? Uh, was the last? Yeah, that that's possible. Yeah, I I probably made her a, a teacher. <laughs> she can have access to everything now. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, we'll work <laughs> on that. So, so that's an issue. You're still getting it unblocked. Youth voices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, our technology department is completely um, understaffed and overwhelmed right now, and um, so yeah, we're working on that. So, you know, that's one example. But when I think about, uh, you know, we got an echo here somewhere. Do people want to check their earphones. Oh, you know what? Yep. Well, whatever. It's it's good. I I mute myself when I'm not talking. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Thanks. Um. Anyway, um. What I was going to say is that when I was thinking about issues that need to be addressed, certainly, um, opening up the web to our schools, um, is a big issue. Um, is that fair to say? Um, and you know, you're you're not being able to use youth voices until you get that taken care of is one good example. I can't get on to Google Plus in my school, right? So that's another good example. Um, but, you know, and I, and I know I can, but it's like a whole process you have to go through. And it ha so that would be one wonderful thing to, to put on the list of, uh, you know, opening up the, the, the web to our students. Um, just wanted to mention that. Um, I want to circle around back to Jose and ask you again what you're working on with your kids, um, Jose Rodriguez, uh, and how you can imagine joining us on Youth Voices. And then we'll get back to Occupy stuff um, as we go here. Jose, we can't quite Yeah, we here. started, just to touch on Occupy, we started uh, Occupy. L can you hear me now? Or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We started Occupy LUSD yesterday, actually, yesterday afternoon. And so that's going on. I, I kind of stay, I've been staying in the background of that issue, <laughs> even though our, our very first theme in our language arts units happens to be you know, to stand up what you believe in. So I, I, I'm trying to see how I'm going to loop it back to, to my own classroom. But just regarding what I'm up to, I, I, I've done a lot of podcasting with my students the last few years. I was teaching third grade. So now with a little bit older students and some of them back in my classroom, they have that experience. So I'm, I'm looking at Youth Voice as a, as a place where, you know, I can share what's, what's going on. And at this point, you know, we're still in the first uh, quarter. And and so a lot of the things that, I've, that have been done are, are done by me so far. 
and uh, I'm thinking of starting like an after school club where we're, we're doing what I call Kids Radio LA and, and do some podcasting there. So, I mean, and that's where I'm at and, 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 and I want to touch it to their experiences in LA and then being able to connect with others. So we call, we call ourselves fifth grade connections. So um, that's, that's why I saw Youth Voices as a great opportunity for, for my students. Say more about your themes. Uh, stand well, up and well, just like well, our language arts theme is based on stories, and and our very first theme happens to be, you know, stand up for what you believe in. So we started with some stories around the civil rights movement. Uh, we did some stories on, um, anim, you know, animal kind of rights, and and then we also looked at just just this week we were looking going back to the American Revolution and how you know people in Boston were standing up to you know the the British and and so we're tying it to that but at the same time uh, you know you guys mentioned Occupy uh, Wall Street and, uh, and everything that's happening so uh, you know I'm trying to see how I can make those connections for my students that these stories that we see or the or these discussions that we have in class also do relate to the real world and, and what's happening now and 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 that concept of the 99 and and, and the one percent you know it, it, it's abstract to them because they're you know we're talking about nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds so so that's that's what I'm working on and, and, and Youth Voices, I think, would be an opportunity for me to get some, some more ideas. Paul, can I, can I jump in for a second? Please, yeah. Because I'm thinking of what you were saying about the, the web and keeping the web open. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of um, just the idea of allowing our curriculum to be open enough where when things like this happen that it's okay to say, like, oh wow this really big thing is happening we might not get to like this little story or this whatever thing we were supposed to do because we're gonna try to actually talk about things that are happening now and too often we don't do that and we just say oh well you know that's great that's happening but we gotta read page 57 and we gotta do these math problems so sorry we're not gonna have time to talk about it so um, I think the, the I definitely want to look into the youth voices stuff because I think that um, I know just just having those conversations with kids are really important and just know and making them realize that it's okay to you know stop what we're doing when something this important or at least this big is going on you know i i tend to tie what's happening to, like, to current events uh, out here in la we have what we call flow vocabulary which is a, a site of uh, educators and and they do like the weekend wrap and and it's it's it's, it's good for the kids because they, they get an opportunity to to see like the music they like, but in con with content, and so I, I do that once a week, and at, at, le at least I'm able to pull back from what I'm doing that seems a little bit tedious and boring, and, and then to something that's real for them. You know, I, I was showing a couple of clips from Democracy Now, and there was one with Immortal Technique on it, and when I first heard his rap, he was down at um, Occupy Wall Street. I I didn't get it, <laughs> so I wasn't sure I wanted to present it to the kids. But the the students explained it to me, um, <laughs> and um, it they they like started paying attention once they saw what he was saying, and so that kind of um, you know familiar familiarity was important for them to kind of recognize what was going on. Um, but you know, I I wish there was more live stream going on. I, I I have been playing the live stream in my classroom, kind of in the background, and when I can turn the sound on, we turn the sound on. So that kind of ongoing, you know, we can just kind of connect with what's happening, is one of the ways that it's always going on in my room. But, and that wasn't a very good opening for anybody, but somebody jump in here. <laughs> What are you thinking? Well, it, it, to what's going on, or to student interest. I mean, we're uh, we're we're kind of moseying through the preamble to the Constitution and branches of government, bill rights, and um, talking about principles behind government. And and there's a lot happening now, obviously, in our in our world, in our nation. Um, but for students who aren't plugged into that, they have other things they can do. Like I don't need to go to the textbook to assess whether a kid understands provide for the common defense or not when the kid volunteers to draw, you know, pictures of people defending their town from a werewolf invasion. Like, 
the kid kind of has common defense right there, you know? Now, Chad, as far as the Constitution kind of goes, and, and Cynthia, um, we're going to start reading 1984, so nice tie-in to, you, you know, the the person who protests, you know, uh, hopefully things turn out a little differently for uh, current times, but, um, you know, it, it's my chance to look at uh, political language. So one of the things I was thinking is, uh, you know, I've got a broad range of students, so I've got some Tea Partiers and I've got some occupiers, you know, uh, and so I'm going to kind of leave it open to, uh, but I'm going to restrict it, I think, to those two things. And we're going to look at the language of uh, Occupy and the language of the Tea Party and just kind of um, try to tease out some facts there. Because what my students find is that they get overwhelmed with uh, just starting to get into a topic. Sometimes just uh, they get on information overload. So I think we'll take that up as a group and try to examine just those two protest movements. And so, you know, the conservative folks, if they want to do the Tea Party, you know, go for it. And, and But, you know, look carefully at the language. And so that's where, like, I can introduce the founding documents and stuff like that and freedom of speech. And so, um, yeah, I think it's going to go really well. Anybody have any one thing, for Chris oh. there. <laughs> Go ahead. We all just start talking at once. Um, one thing I just was interesting, I'm, I'm hearing people talk about, you know, comparing this to the to history and comparing and making these comparisons. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware that they're talking about having a Occupy Wall Street convention in the spring in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. The General Assembly tonight is, I think it's tonight, is meeting about it. Um, the idea is you know, obviously this is the birthplace of the nation and it's where all this stuff went down, you know, taverns and pubs and people talking and revolution and the rest is history. So, um, you know, that's even interesting. That's like an actual connection where you can make that comparison with kids saying not only, you know, was this um, the hist history, but now people are taking that history and trying to necessarily, necessarily repeat it. But, um, you know, there's just that connection right there. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. And I was thinking one, was, of the, oh. one of the things on Youth Voices and certainly in my own curriculum over the past few years that I've been interested in is, um, well, the way we summarize it as a channel on Youth Voices is local knowledge, global attitude. Um, and this is a perfect example of um, looking at how the uh, all the occupying in different cities is going to look different and have different issues, but there there's some sort of I don't know attitude or or connection between them that's important as well. David, go ahead. I was gonna yeah I was gonna say uh, since I was I've been very connected to the Occupy Eugene Oregon uh, site and kind of went through many of the general assemblies. And one of the things I found to be the most uh, kind of deep learning for me was just watching a group of people who did not know each other try to decide if consensus was the appropriate way to come up to come to consensus. Um, and honestly, I think that would be a great exercise for any class, uh, even mm -hmm. five and four year olds. I think that uh, just going through that exercise and just Seeing what happens is is a very good learning tool, and it connects to all the everything. Connects to history, how people come together as a group, how people make decisions, and it ties directly into what happen is what is happening in um, Occupy Wall Street. As this is Justin. I learned a lot about it, and I don't know if I actually agree with consensus anymore. Uh, but I only learned that because I had to go through the kind of process to get See? there. Say more. Why don't you agree with it anymore? I, I mean, it just, it's interesting watching people who have, there's, there's a lot of ways that people can take control over it. Um, it's not necessarily as democratic as one would hope uh, based on just the feel of the room, the way that people talk, the way that people, when people decide to block. Um, and it, it can leave a lot of people out who just don't feel necessarily uh, welcome to talk if other people 
have a more powerful voice. Um, it's interesting. I think it's messy and it 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 deserves to be looked at deeper. But I think it's an interesting process, and really, it's the only way to talk about it is to go through it with a group of people. I think. Um, I mean, just even what we do on the Cooperative Catalyst. I mean, just our back channel, a little like consensus building, is not always easy. And it's but going through it, we come to a better understanding of kind of who, where everybody's kind of thinking, and just the process is a lot more healthy than just one person making the decisions for everybody else. And I wonder how many times we let our students experience that. Um, you know, just they're always like that idea of consensus building means that you have to do a lot of listening and a lot of, like you said, it takes a lot of time. I mean, I, I lived in a co-op for four years that was completely consensus and we would have two hour discussions over whether we were going to have like organic bananas, you know, and it was like, kill me now. <laughs> but that process, I mean, you, you learn so much about yourself and you build that confidence to be able to speak your opinion and speak your mind and you build knowledge with other people and you, and you hear other ways of thinking about something and that's learning. Um, and I don't know how often, you know, and that, you know, maybe the youth, the, and even the youth voices thing, you know, that idea of having your voice heard um, is really powerful. I wonder how much we actually give kids a chance to do that in their classrooms. I was also going to th uh, say I, that. Go ahead, Rod. Go ahead. Jose. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I know that when I I do any kind of recordings or just a, a classroom experience or a classroom discussion, my students want to hear the recording again. And so e even if I just play it back, because I, I do all, all my recordings on my smartphone and nowadays with a Google recorder, and and they want to hear it right away. And, and so sometimes I, I just do I, I don't do any editing I, I just play it or, or or if I upload it to you know to our blog they want to go back to it and, and they they want to hear their their own voice and, and at first it's like you know they're timid about it they don't, don't want to share out but as, as the year goes along they they, they, they want to go back to them more and, and they want to voice uh, what the what they're thinking or and, and I see that with with the kids that I had in third grade and now they're in fifth grade I see them as a more articulate than than some of the other kids that were that I, that I had seen in in other classrooms, but and now they're they're looping back to me, so it, it, it's it's kind of interesting. So I got to say, first of all, it's wonderful that you get these kids two years later. Um, is that? Been a wonderful experience, or what's that been like? Well, yeah, well, not all of them. Uh, I, I select. I mean, it. Uh, there was about 120 kids that were in, in that grade level and I had 20 and, and now I have 30 kids but I, I, I got back I got back like six of them and so I do see at least in, in two of the, the girls that were very active then when we did some podcasting that when we have classroom discussions they're, they are very articulate and, and I've seen their language development in this past two years and and now with the when, with the few podcasts that I've done so far, uh, they know <laughs> the procedure and, and they know how to introduce themselves and, and 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 they go through that. So yeah, I'd second that too because um, you know when I've had my students record their voice and and listen to it back again, you know I think that's really an important step for writers is to actually to literally hear their voice. Um, because so often, you know, the page is mute and uh, the books are mute. And uh, so I noticed the writing improved quite a bit, like you're talking about, Jose. Them recording it, first of all, getting it together to record, and then um, hearing it played back to them is, uh, you know, a really important step. You know, and, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish with it. No, I was just going to say that uh, I tend to preload it with some kind of graphic organizer or a pre-classroom discussion before I actually do the recording. So they do have something to look at, even if it's just a few notes, and, and, and that will help them get the discussion going. I was just going to say, um, hearing uh, our voices as adult learners and with parents and community members too, I think is really critically important for change right now. and so often like the conversations that we we have in schools i think get um boxed right i think they get boxed inside uh you know what what 
what are we going to buy, what are we going to use, how are we going to schedule, and there's not this fundamental conversation uh, about the how and why of schooling that, that I think maybe we can have now. So I, I was just going to ask the JLV if he's still if he's still there about where Occupy Your Classroom is and like who's involved and how that effort is moving along right now to capture voices and help make them heard. I think he might be. I think you're – is he there? Hello, JLV, are you there? There you are. <laughs> Move it around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, re-go over that question because oh, I sure. have a battery here, so. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Um, I, I was curious about um, where Occupy Your Classroom, like w how 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 has it come to where it is and where is it, uh, who's involved, and how is it helping that, that process of capturing voice and amplifying it and getting the, the kind of core bedrock conversations about teaching and learning and schooling and, and why we do those things. Uh, where is it in promoting that kind of conversation rather than the conversations that we kind of get boxed into at schools about products and schedules and staffing. Wow, um, that's powerful. Well, I think it, it had a lot to do with the initial uh, posting that I wrote um, What about a month ago, like just giving about five very solid tips, very quick things that we can do to improve education. That, that's, that's ended to kind of uh, set the tone. Then, you know, there's always those um, mini rants that I like to go on regarding um, pedagogy, and it, it tends to have a um, Freudian style, like Paolo Freudian or whatever, where I just kind of, you know, try to, you know, get into a, a, a message about what is it that will change the conversation from we're anti this to we're pro that. Um, once that became part of the conversation, then I mean, it just took, it, it just went insane. I don't know. I don't know what happened from there. Like, obviously, Good uh, Magazine picked it up. Then Rosario Dawson at some point picked it up. Then Ravage, of course, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my effort, you know, I guess in contrast to what I see with Occupy the U, which I think is, is excellent in um, paralleling the efforts that Occupy Wall Street has done in regards to identifying who's part of the 99% in education. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of seen my role and, you know, Stephen Lazar and other people who've been mm -hmm. kind of working under that hashtag as um, what, what can we do next? What are the sorts of things you can do right now that can make a really big impact um, really quickly? Um, starting from the very, very small to the very, very large. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around that. I mean, it's very, I guess, high philosophical um, in contrast to, you know, like what, what the everyday person feels like in regards to education. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of where it's it's gone, but it, it, I haven't seen it go to, oh, my schedule's hard or um, I don't have enough supplies. It's been way, way bigger than that. Right, right, and that that's that's a that's what I, the conversation I, I hope we have. That's um, I like how you describe that going from anti this to pro that, is I feel like one of the things that we we work on a lot at the co-op through the back channel and the posts, and sometimes succeed at and sometimes don't, is moving from describing the problem to describing our solutions. And I think we have a we have a pretty healthy community and mix of those things. Um, and I think maybe Occupy Edu is, is an attempt to to go to the next step and give voice to, to what different people um, stand for. So I, I might just say, I just, I, I'm going to go on tonight or tomorrow morning and maybe encourage a lot of cross posting and cross comping back and forth between those two hashtags and the places and um, get them helping each other more. Well, that, that is, if they haven't done that already. Um, <laughs> they, they... Well, I, I think we could post, I think we could post and host more. Oh, uh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Like we have, we seem to, um, I mean, we have particular audiences, but they're definitely starting to intermingle, which I think is appropriate because again, it's, it's kind of like, we don't want it to be a, a singular channel. We don't want to get caught in a silo. Like we really want as many people as possible to kind of, um, talk about what it is to, you know, transform education. And, you know, there's powerful movements within Occupy and there's powerful movements you know, within, you know, EDU versus Classroom versus um, LAUSD, which I know just came up with their own. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think there's one for NYC DOE. Um, there's there's a bunch of them, but they're all addressing the same thing. They're just doing it in their own uh, scale. Cool. Well, thank you. Of course. So we have, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes here. I'm wondering if it would be worth, it would be for me, um, if we could start cataloging what we as educators can learn if we pay attention to the Occupy folks. Um, I mean, I think we've said some of it already, but I think just repeating that is really important. And I'll, I'll start by saying that one of my best experiences as a professional was working in a new school called University Heights um, where we did everything by consensus. And I like to think back on those years as being years where we got rid of grading, we got rid of, you know, separating kids into different, um, different grades by age. Um, and well, we got rid of a lot of things <laughs> and, and, and restarted school in a big way. But the heart of it was consensus. And if I were to build a new school right now, I would like to think about consensus as being the heart of what that school should be. And, and I'm just wondering where I am right now, if we could explore doing more consensus decision making. Um, like, I don't even know how decisions get made, and I think most teachers don't, right? And I don't think students know how gets de decisions get made in their classrooms. So I think on all of those levels, if we can make more transparent how decisions are made, and then think about bringing consensus into that, I think that would be one big thing we've learned from Occupy Wall Street. Anybody want to second that and then add to that? And, uh, yeah, I well, would. I well, would, I, uh, well, uh, I would just quick. say that I don't think we teach students to do it very well either. Like, and I'm speaking maybe from my own experience, but we teach them how to um, argue persuasively, how to win debates, uh, you know, how to spot logical fallacies. But we we don't really, and I'm speaking for myself. I don't think I do a good enough job of teaching them how to come to, or you know, you learn the skills to come to consensus. So that's something I'm working on myself. I, I would uh, second it, but also say there, there's a whole tradition of alternative schools that have been using consensus for a long time, and we have a lot to learn from them. And back, they have a lot to learn from schools that are maybe not so alternative. I think part of that is just reaching out to the people who have been doing this kind of work um, already and building those relationships and not um, seeing ourselves in silos. I mean, that's something we can learn is that education has about 60% of everybody believe, agrees with the same things. We need to start working along those, those lines, just like uh, the 99% have been doing um, together. Uh, I think that's one of the things I learned is that we don't need to uh, necessarily fight about all the things that we're against uh, that are different about our all our different movements. That uh, if we can find that core and just move along forward with that, we have a lot to teach each other. Yeah, and Chris, this is kind of backwards and off, but your your um, Tea Party kids and the ninety nine percent kids, um, it'd be great if they could instead of like arguing with each other, if they could look at what, what's the core between those two movements instead of what's so different about them. Yeah. Right, that's, that's where we're going. Hmm. Interesting. Anybody else, jump in here. <laughs> well, I'd like to say that I've been teaching now for 15 years and when I came into LAUSD, um, I came into school that was based on consensus. It, it was called the LEARN model and and we, the uh, principal and the vice principal, would uh, have a team that, that was built around uh, lead teachers. And not necessarily for grade level, but uh, there were lead teachers that were seen as instruction leaders that would um, be part of the planning for, for, for the school. And not only planning as in events, the, the 
in nowadays we all we do is just planning for business but planning as in where do we want to take our school with uh, English learners what do we want to take our school with with mathematics or how are we going to integrate the sciences and 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 I unfortunately I came in at the tail end of, of that uh, movement and then uh, you know after that uh, you know we, we ended up with uh, direct instruction and, and, and you know it's been it's been a downhill a spiral thing as, since then but I, I, I do see what, what can, it, could, it could still come around I think it's, we just need to start those conversations again in our, in our own uh, in our own schools what difference do you think it made when you were doing that consensus building uh, I think it made, it made a lot of difference because there was buy-in I mean I, I as a you know as a new teacher uh, was able to see that my my colleagues and, and 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 I was able to buy into the different ideas and, and I was able to contribute even though I was new to teaching but I was uh, I, I was had prior experiences in, in different areas and, and and so just being part of the decision making uh, was was important to me then and it still is now but it seems that nowadays I'm just dictated you know instead of like a my my team right now would you know was thinking of having teaming for my the fifth grade teachers were thinking of having teaming for science and our principal just said no you're tested in science and, and everybody needs to be with with their students and, and so that that kind of thing where it was not a discussion it was not a you know a, how is it going to affect the instruction it was just a a, a, a top to bottom uh, kind of decision paul i'm going to jump in because i want to let jose know that i would love to Learn, hear more about that because my new obsession is a cooperatively run school that sounds a lot like what you were talking about where the administrative team is actually teachers um, rather than some admin team that doesn't that doesn't really teach at all um, so I think that we were probably in the same circle on Google Plus so I would love to connect and talk about that uh, I'd be interested too. We, um, our school is small enough that we wind up making many of our decisions um, by consensus, scheduling, staffing. Um, we have some mixed age classrooms um, or mixed grade level classrooms. And the only reason we were able to do that is to kind of develop a relationship over the year where we made a kind of series of decisions together that brought us to a point where we we're able to. Um, talk about the structural pieces of our school and, and change them because we think best fits our student with the support of our, our supervisors. So there's probably a lot more. And Mary Beth, I'd like to hear a little more about. Oops, we've got a lot of. Oh, it's um, David. If you could mute. I think we. Oh, when I'm I sorry, talk, yeah. I hear me on you. There we go. Thanks. Mary Beth. Maybe you could say a little more. How are you enacting that obsession? <laughs> how are you playing with? Uh, yeah, you understand. <laughs> um, well, aside from blogging about it, um, I did actually start a document where I started laying out a mission, a vision, a structure for an actual school. Um, my obsession right now is is uh, the food co-op that I'm in. I'm on a board of a food co-op so I've actually seen this whole process of building a board um, electing you know having an election running meetings um, having decisions done cooperatively um, and building that kind of community so kind of taking that, those experiences and applying them to uh, a school is kind of how I'm, where I'm at right now you know there's a lot of talk in the mainstream press about where's the message in the Occupy Wall Street. And I just want to scream when I hear that because the, the mess, the process is the message. Like, you know, hello? <laughs> and if you don't get that, you know, I'm not sure you are going to get it. Right. So, but anyway, I, you know, um, I wanted to ask about the public microphone, which is a wonderful, wonderful process. And I, I was trying to figure out if we could do that in the classroom somehow or how we enact that. Um, does somebody want to describe who's been down there, describe what that's like and what that feels like? JLV, did you observe the public microphone at all where people were? I, yeah. I haven't as of yet, but um, I know uh, a couple of friends who have. I know a bunch of friends, um, actually. And it seems to me that the public microphone in general 
um, has been fairly, op you know, fairly uh, equal opportunity. But then every so often, it does also lend itself to um, certain experts or celebrities also getting up there and just speaking uh, for special talks or whatever, which it kind of reminds me like of, a, of an anti-TED talk, if, if we should have one. Um, I, I find it interesting that, you know, like we, we, could, we could technically create that sort of environment where, in fact, we just let a kid maybe speak on whatever their their you know their present mind state is and just let them go off for a good uh two three minutes and just let them vent a bit even if it's unrelated to what's going on um that'd be very interesting and very uh i guess uh anarchy based though i'm always a, a fan of just a little bit of anarchy just a, a smidgen um that's important to have in a classroom where you know, everything has to be so structured, it has to be so, you know, well done, well organized. Um, I don't know how much um, Danielson and Accenture would approve of that. <laughs> That's a New York City joke. That's how we're being evaluated these days. But anyway, uh, yeah. I'm, David, oh, were you going to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I've seen the, the people, uh, it's, I've, Heard it called the people's mic. Um, uh, yeah, that's why. Uh, that's what I was talking about. Good. Yeah. 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 The people. Um, yeah. I think I think it's a power. It's powerfully. It's powerful in that it. It just it just shows how many people are there and kind of the energy. I think it's the energy behind it more than anything that's powerful. And I'm I'm really just intrigued by the idea of five hundred kids or a thousand kids marching to the. Uh, to a gym, to their gymnasium, and just occupying the gym for an hour and having a general assembly. And I was talking to some friends about this. It was like, you know, they said, well, if that happened at our school, all 500 would be suspended. And I said, well, what would happen if 500 kids were suspended, even in, you know, uh, some very kind of troubled neighborhoods and stuff? I mean, I think that would make the news, and I think that's kind of really where some of this needs to go is I think some ki children, students of any age really just need to stand up and say, hey, look, we're here too. And I think that's part of what the people's mic is. It's like, we're here too. Listen to us. Um, I I don't know how that would happen because I can't, I'm not, I don't work in a school, but I'd probably be one of those teachers right there with them if I, if I did work in a school. Well, David, I know, and I know Paul, it's 1001, but David, that did happen in Philly. We had hundreds of students walk out of their schools um, because of the Renaissance School Initiative going on. A teacher almost got fired because she apparently gave a token to a student that allowed them to attend some protest or something like that, and she was called enabling. Um, she kept her job thanks to the union, but um, you know it did happen in Philadelphia. Um, 120 kids, I think, walked out of Martin Luther King Jr. High School. Um, so, you know, it can happen. They didn't get suspended. They didn't, because like you said, it's like, what do we do when that many kids walk out? You can't suspend everybody. So um, it wasn't totally effective, but I think that it's it, it did make a statement and it made the news and it made people listen. That's all important. I just... I, I don't know. I feel like Chad right now, but I just also want to bring it back individually <laughs> and think about how I could change even my own classroom. Like, what if every Thursday was General Assembly Day where I don't come with the agenda and I ask the class what the agenda is and I let the agenda build there? You know, so just uh, I keep thinking about what if every day was. Yeah. Well, let me start with Thursday and then we can see. <laughs> But fair enough, yeah. But but I think that I, I think I just want to make the point that I I'm watching the movement and um, trying to learn what to learn, like how we can how we can teach and learn differently in our own classrooms. So I think there's a lot to learn there. Um, we are a little bit over ten o'clock here. Uh, let's uh, could we. 
can we come back around to um, Sherry and see what if you have any last thoughts, and then quickly go around if anybody else hasn't been talking. Sherry, what were you thinking of? <laughs> okay. Um, David, we still have feedback. Good, wait, good. You got it. Okay. Go ahead, Sherry. Okay. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, and I think you all are doing fantastic things with your students. Um, I'm not sure my students would walk out for the reasons your <laughs> students would, but um, we're. Um, I don't think it's about walking out. I think Go it's ahead. about giving voice, and I think you do that, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, right. yes, very much so. Giving them a voice, and I like your idea of the the Thursday the General Assembly, and as long as my walkthrough isn't that day, I could probably <laughs> do that. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us back to the reality there. Sure. <laughs> Jose, any any thoughts here at the end? And then we'll just go around quickly and close off here. Uh, Jose Rodriguez. <laughs> well, um, I, I think um, it, it, just, just I think it's making it real that uh, what is happening uh, throughout the states, uh, United States, is important, and that. Um, if we work in you know communities that are underprivileged uh you now i work in an all uh, all mexican school you could say or 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 minority school and the teachers are minorities too and the principals are minority and it's like sometimes we don't understand that there's something outside of us and and and, and we, we we need to go outside that filter too and and that um you know, we are part of the 99%, you know, <laughs> even if we are, if we're happy about it. And, and that this, at the same time that, uh, mm -hmm. there, there are things that our, our kids, uh, uh, our kids can learn and, and, ha and ha have a better future. And, 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 and it starts with Like you see, like you guys said, with, with, with these opportunities to, for, 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 for the kids to, to kind of uh, get out there and, and, and I'll use what, um, I think I heard somewhere on, on the net where just just voicing what's on my mind right now or blogging what's on my mind and start with that and 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 then let them build a discussion around it. And just actually, take note. can I jump in Go one ahead, more Sherry. time? Yeah. I changed yeah. my mind. The next walkthrough I have, I think I will just open it up <laughs> to the students. <laughs> Fair enough. Get as uh, he just said, we have to go outside of where we are and know that. There's more than just our little box. And so it'd be good for everybody to hear what the students are thinking. And I hope that's what Youth Voices is about. So I really encourage you guys mm -hmm. to, to jump on there and, and you know, we can start sharing um, our little communities with each other. Because, uh, yep. you know, my kids in the South Bronx are uh, in a pretty closed off community too in a lot of ways but so yeah getting things out is really important jlb <laughs> final thoughts there but thank you and please come back another wednesday uh, both jose's but jlb final thoughts i guess my only final thought really is um we we really need to find ways to find solutions and constantly be on um i guess on a, in a mode where we're not um, just saying this is not what we're about. This is not what we're about. More about um, what is it that we stand for, and what are the possible ways, and trying to experiment in ways and trying to grow. I mean, um, I, I'm far from perfect in my own profession. I know it, um, and naturally, I do a lot of self-reflection. And in that, I try to find uh, the best possible solution for what I know my kids can do, and then try to. Uh, go one step ahead of that instead of just saying, well, you know, they're never going to learn um, that that's, you know, been my struggle. And I know that's something that a lot of people struggle with, but if we keep um, our, our focus on solutions and on trying to improve, uh, you know, what ha what's happening with our 30, 60, 90, 150 students at a time, um, I, I really do believe we can make a profound impact. Thank you for joining us. And David, any thoughts to leave us with here? I would just actually just say exactly what Jose just said. I, <laughs> that's exactly what I've been trying to say for a long time. And we need to be for something. Uh, 
just it, we once we're for something, we can figure out how to get there. It's just so many people are scared to be for something, and I think the time is right now. And uh, let's just start moving towards that. Cynthia, thank you. Cynthia. <laughs> Any thoughts as we're closing? Well, um, for me, it's really interesting because I feel like I've shifted from a school district that was very student centered to a school district and especially the high school where the students are very disempowered. And so um, it's going to be very interesting to jump into 1984 with them and talk a lot about power and about resistance to that sort of control. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with the solution base because right now because the kids are feeling powerless end up creating a really unhealthy dynamic of just us versus them and all sorts of ways to um, you know stick it to the administration or something and it's it's just an unhealthy place right now so you know it'll be interesting to see how 1984 um, works its way into that discussion and um, looking forward to being a part of the discussion on youth voices so both you and Chris are going to do that you're yes. Oh, cool. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Chris, and any last I'm thoughts? And then uttering. Chad, and then we got to go. I, I, yeah. You, you um, have what to I'm go, thinking by the way, is, you know, um, about how to give voice to students, right? We talked about that, like, literally with Jose about the podcast. But, you know, one way to kind of bring in Paul's idea of the assembly is um, what I do is open class now with just the latest posts um, from my class. I just look at the discussion list from my students and uh, anyone in that section who's written something, we pull it up and they kind of lead a mini discussion about um, you know what they've written and, and that takes all kinds of different directions but you know um, an interesting way to give them voice. Chris, quick tech note, I just made two of my students editors on the site. <laughs> And when you do that, okay. they can then promote um, stories to the front page also. Um, nice. They're all, I picked kids who are good with grammar, so they go in and make some corrections too. But they can edit other kids' stuff and promote. So you could, you could pick a couple kids and give them more power over the site that way. Ownership too. But okay. Just to mention. Thanks. Chad, you get last word tonight. Uh, this is a really good time to dare something worthy, and if uh, we risk uh, opening up our classrooms and changing them into places where kids can experience personally meaningful learning, uh, we'll wind up with a lot more personally meaningful teaching. Well, that was a good summary. Um, thank you all for hanging out over 10 o'clock here, um, at 10 o'clock in the east at least, I should say. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, we're just going to close out here. Um, thank you so much for a stimulating conversation. Please come back another Wednesday uh, when we invite you and we'll figure all this out. Um, Monica Hardy will be back with us. She's in New York City right now, but she'll be back with us next week. Um, and we want to thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo who made all this happen at edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. And um, we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. See ya. Good night.